You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm your host, Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, April 7th. We're sharing local news and resources, um, focusing on what's important in Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. My guests today are Victor Lagunas, president of the Davis Teachers Association, and Winter City Council member Jesse Lauren. On Friday, we'll speak with Yolo County Supervisor Jim Provenza and Davis Mayor Brett Lee. This show airs live at noon on Tuesdays and Fridays and repeats at 5 p.m. both days and at noon on Sunday. And you can also listen online at kdrt.org and find a compilation of resources there as well. So I don't focus on the COVID-19 numbers every week, but I do feel it's important to touch base with them occasionally. So as of April 7th, the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, reports a total of 374,329 confirmed cases of COVID-19 nationwide with 12,064 deaths. The California Department of Public Health reports 14,336 cases and 343 fatalities. And in Yolo County, also as of April 7th, our numbers are 50 confirmed cases and one death. But Yolo Public Health also indicates that only 612 tests have been performed in the county. So with numbers expected to peak in mid-May, we are strongly advised, encouraged, inveigled to maintain strict physical distancing and to wear masks if we need to be out in public. For local information and links to both state and federal health agencies, you can visit the control panel at yolocounty.org. They have all sorts of information. And over the weekend, Governor Gavin Newsom issued two executive orders related to COVID-19. The first provides expanded access to child care for essential workers. The waiver will allow eligibility for state-subsidized child care to pr prioritize essential workers, including health care professionals, emergency response personnel, law enforcement, and grocery workers. The order also allows California to take advantage of new federal flexibility to provide pandemic SNAP. S-N-A-P stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Benefits to children to reduce food insecurity. The state is expected to release guidelines for the order today. Governor Newsom also launched Project Room Key, a first in the nation initiative to secure hotel and motel rooms to protect homeless individuals from COVID-19. Visit covid19.ca.gov to learn more about the state's ongoing COVID-19 response. And on Friday, one of the things we'll be discussing with Davis Mayor Brett Lee is how the, the city is working and working in conjunction with the county to protect the homeless population at this time. And folks, the Davis City Council meeting tonight will focus almost exclusively on items related to COVID-19. And you can get there in a variety of ways. You can tune in on Comcast Channel 16, AT&T Menu 99, or online at cityofdavis.org. Uh, viewer, they're taking viewer comments in advance, and you can also view the meeting by Zoom. And for all the details on that, I'll just direct you to visit cityofdavis.org. And Health and Human Resources Services, Health and Human Services has new resources to help with unemployment benefits. Call 530-661-2641 Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. An unemployment benefits representative is on site to provide help with applications, troubleshoot any issues, and answer general questions. And Yolo County Animal Services can help with cat or dog food and cat litter as well. Call ahead to 530 668-5237 during their business hours, which are Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Saturday from 8 to 4, and they'll prepare it for pickup. The service is designed for those who are struggling and lack access to affordable pet supplies. On a lighter note, Monday is Teddy Bear Hunt Day in Yolo County. People around the community are placing teddy bears in visible locations so that families and others in need of distraction can go on teddy bear scavenger hunts. 
you can visit the Yolo County Teddy Bear Hunt page on Facebook. As of this report, the group boasts nearly 600 members. And as we're getting ready for our first call, I, I want to share that in our neighborhood on, uh, on St. Patrick's Day, they did a similar thing, and it was pretty cute. All right, we're getting ready to take our first call here. All right, uh, area schools were closed weeks ago with the announcement made last week that Davis Joint Unified School District schools are officially closed for the rest of the school year. As the district prepares to launch its massive online instruction module next week, with us today is Victor Lagunas, president of the Davis Teachers Association. Welcome, Victor. Hey, Autumn. Thanks so much for having me on the show. It's great to hear your voice. So I want others to know that in addition to your work with DTA, you teach eighth grade uh, social studies and U.S. history at Da Vinci Junior High. So you're, you're in the thick of it at that level, too. So I want to check in. I, I've seen a number of teacher friends post about long hours of training via Zoom meetings. Um, how's that been for you, and how are our teachers holding up? Um, you know, I, I think that's a great place to start. Um, it really highlights the amount of dedication and focus that teachers have been putting into this, you know, as the, the situation with COVID-19 continues to grow, um, what we've done is we've created a, a long-term plan um, in, in expectation for school closure. And that became official, uh, you know, just at the last school board meeting on uh, last Thursday, in which we decided to close down schools. Uh, for the remainder of the year. And so it's really good that we've been in this discussion as a whole district going through this because we have a long-term plan for what distance learning will look like. Um, and that means that we'll be able to have a, a framework that we don't need to backpedal off of, right. that we have a clear system to work off of. And so with that, we were uh, current, we've just finished what we called phase one, which mm -hmm. like you said, was professional development. So really thinking about um, what does distance learning look like what are the technology tools that we need to be trained on in? Mm -hmm. And then um, and then how do we plan our curriculum differently? Um, you know, instruction is, is going to uh, impact all of the curriculum that you deliver throughout the year. And so these first three weeks in phase one have all been focused around that so that as phase two, the actual distance learning begins, um, we have a really solid framework for every teacher to know what it is that they plan to do uh, remotely. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the concerns about teaching online? And and I also want to address, you know, there may be benefits there too, but um, is there anyone this is going to leave out? What are the impediments to some people participating, those kind of things? Absolutely. You know, um, one of the things uh, as a union leader, um, but then, you know, every teacher has expressed these concerns is that there's going to be uh, challenges that we have to overcome for access. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that this is this is something that's accessible to all that um, we, and that we're delivering equitable and effective learning through distance learning. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a few things that have been done. Um, you know, the, the district office has maintained the meals programs that have been offered through a, a few different sites around the district. Mm -hmm. um, and what they've done is they've tagged on to that also the checkout process for Chromebooks. And while the district has been doing that, they've also been looking at um, how to gain access, because it's not just having the Chromebook, but also having the Wi-Fi. Right. And then uh, as we do that, we're really making sure that the beginning of, of distance learning is also making sure that all of our students are checking in, that they are able to log on, that they're, they themselves are training through uh, the use of you know, whatever digital medium, which is like Google Classroom or something like that, mm -hmm. in order to access the materials. Because that's our number one concern is that the accessibility is there for every single student. Yeah, I, I think one of the things the situation is highlighting is something I've written about for years, which is the digital divide. And, and you, you really touched on it, too. It's not just you know, do I have a Chromebook or a phone I, or, or a device I can do this work on, but does my can my family afford broadband? Can, do I have adequate, you know, access to, to yeah, process you're talking all this about digital capital. Right, right. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, at, at, when we were rolling this out, that was something that was very clear to us, that we knew that that was going to be a challenge. 
Um, but then there are varying circumstances for the home lives of individuals, both staff and students, that are going to uh, impact what this distance learning looks like. Because if we state, hey, uh, let's log on and have like a, a small a small team meeting to do like discussion around, let's say, a book topic, right? Yeah. Well, if a student at home has two siblings um, that maybe they, they are looking after, then they can't log on. Or if there are multiple Chromebooks that need to be used and the bandwidth doesn't, you know, uh, give them access. So we have to also consider that the, whatever model we roll out is flexible enough to meet all of the needs of all of our students and that they can all access it. Because like you said, that digital divide is something that we're really uh, butting up against right now. Right. So this all goes live uh, next week, April 13th. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So our originally when we um, when uh, district uh, staff as well as Davis Teacher Association started meeting to collaborate on this rollout, um, we didn't know uh, whether or not we actually would return on April 13th to classes in the classroom or if we were playing ahead, assuming that it wouldn't. Yeah. And now it's good that it's really great that we've taken this kind of slower approach to it because now we have a framework that will last us through the rest of the school year. Whereas, you know, if we had rushed to put something out and had to, you know, edit that process, that um, that might look a little messier. Um, but we are expected to start right now when we come back from our quote-unquote spring break, which has been a bit extended, um, this coming Monday. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, and we're in, you're in for almost, uh, almost two months of instruction online, so this is going to be one grand adventure for everyone. Um, I, I'm sure wishing all the, the teachers, as you know, my kids are, are aged out of DJUSD now, but I, I'm seeing the post online every day of parents trying to homeschool and, and kids <laughs> trying to, you know, come to terms with this new reality, and it's just not easy on anyone. Well, I can say that teachers are definitely eager to get back to working with their kids. That's right. one of the things I hear most of. They're just, they're really ready for it and yeah. looking forward yeah. Well, while I have you here, let's take a couple minutes to talk about Measure G, which uh, it was looking doubtful there for a while, but it squeaked to victory. Yeah. So um, we are expecting to get the certified number uh, or count tomorrow in okay. the county. Um, so the last update that was given, uh, which uh, had Measure G passing at 67.31, um, was still, you know, it, it was still preliminary because they were talking about 3,000 votes. Mm -hmm. But like you said, um, and this is something that I've been trying to uh, remain optimistic of, is that with so many votes uh, and knowing the, the base of support that we had in Davis, um, I knew that it was going to continue to close the gap and that we would really be in the running the whole way through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my, uh, we still have to wait for the certified count for tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm optimistic for the outcome. I saw, um, you know, a huge number of people, and we had, you know, uh, hundreds of volunteers, quite literally, helping us um, to get the message out and talk about the importance that Measure G could have on our school district. And, um, and I really like that we've been able to show in the, the most recent count where that support really was. Yeah, and I know you and the DTA and a whole bunch of teachers worked really hard on this, and, and the district as well. And um, can you, for those who may not be familiar what we're talking about, can you just provide some highlights of what the, the measure, if passed, it looks like it's apparently going to pass, but we'll know tomorrow, as you said. Um, just kind of recap the highlights of what that will provide for. Yeah, the absolutely. So um, Measure G is a parcel tax for within the, the boundaries of Davis Joint Unified School District um, at $198 per year. Mm -hmm. And uh, and those are paid tw uh, twice a year in $99 increments. Um, and the idea was that uh, this is this is money that is directly allocated to teachers and staff within DJUSD. Um, our school district uh, provides wonderful opportunities for education through the various programs that we have. Um, but one of the things that our uh, state funding formula does is it provides less funding to a district like Davis because of our student population. Mm -hmm. And when you pair that with the great education offering, um, you know, then you, what you really end up with is a shortage, a, a budgetary shortage. And um, in Davis, what that the main point that that looks like is that we have about a three to seven percent compensation gap with neighboring and uh, and comparable districts. And so the idea for Measure G was to have a direct source of funding 
for the purposes of teacher and staff uh, compensation so that we can attract and retain teachers. Because we can have the greatest program, but if there's not a teacher in the classroom working with the kids, or you know, as we're about to do distance <laughs> or on online. WebEx, yeah, <laughs> um, then then that that program is is you know is not going to be fruitful for the students. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that we can continue to attract and retain teachers, particularly with the upcoming teacher shortage that's been you know on, on its way for some time. Uh, the number of people entering the profession is declining, so. We need to make sure that we're we are able to compete for new people in the classroom, so that we can keep uh, the practices in Davis uh, benefiting our students because we really do. Right. Well, I hope my congratulations aren't uh, uh, preemptory, but uh, I, I, you know, I look forward to seeing those final numbers and and uh, wish everyone good luck as you move ahead. Any final thoughts as you get ready to teach your students online? Well, I, I have to say that um, you know it's been it's been amazing to collaborate with district staff and our own teachers that have volunteered time for this rollout, and we're really looking to make sure that we're serving every single student, and that, like I said before, we really want it to be like equitable and effective mm -hmm. across the board, and uh, and the main reason for this is so that people can stay safe because obviously that's our our number one goal, um, and providing a little distraction from the, the need to be home all the time will also be a nice secondary effect. So um, with that, I want to give my thanks to all the people that have put work into this at the district office, the DTA, and then honestly to the, the greater community for their patience, um, mm -hmm. for taking time to try and educate their, you know, their own kids at home, um, trying to take that role on and doing the best that they can. Um, I think flexibility is key during this time, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we really are trying to get a little bit of structure back in there, but it's just overwhelming thanks to everybody that's supported. Well, great. I really appreciate your time calling in today, and I, I want to wish you and all the teachers and all the district staff um, a, a lot of luck as as this uh, plan is implemented. And, you know, just really, I've been thinking a lot about the, the families and, and the students. As I said, my kids are not at that age where I'm having to homeschool them. They're all in college, and it's, uh, oh boy, it's been mind-boggling to watch how folks are trying to cope. And, and uh, I, I hope that there will be new respect accorded to uh, teachers, too, as a result of this process. All right, you take care, Victor. Thanks so much for calling in. Autumn, thanks so much for having me. All right, bye-bye. Okay. We're going to be having another call in just a couple of minutes with uh, Jesse Lauren, who is on the Winters City Council. I'm going to read a couple of more announcements and then uh, I think we'll we'll take a little music break while we wait for Jesse. So here are those. Losing your job amidst a pandemic is traumatic. Onward CA is a resource that's been rapidly deployed by a broad coalition of companies, foundations, and humans who want to help, help you get money or groceries, or child care. OnwardCA.org for more info. And it looks like our call is coming through. So, Jesse Lauren Hello. is a Winter City Council member. Located 15 miles west of Davis, Winters is a charming small town that's made a name for itself via its restaurants and wineries, slash breweries, slash distilleries, and its small town can-do spirit. Here to update us on how the community is faring is Jesse Lauren, who was recently re-elected to the Winter City Council. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Adam. Thank you for inviting me. The last time we worked closely together was on the Paradise, um, the campfire in 2018 yep, out at raising ba money for all our friends up there in Butte County. Yeah, that's when we first met out at Berryessa Brewing and it was one of I don't know, maybe three fire benefits locally that week. I, I do remember right. that. Uh, well, first, congratulations on your re-election. Thank you very much. So I wanted to, to touch base. I, I'm, I'm, I've been doing this show for, uh, this is episode eight today, and I'm slowly trying to get around to some of the, the communities that uh, surround Davis. I, I'm talking a lot to, to elected officials who, you know, cover a broader area, but I, I would love to hear from you, given what I mentioned about the vibrancy of Winters' downtown and, and foodie scene, really. How are the businesses hanging in there? How are they adapting? 
Well, it, it's it's pretty phenomenal. Um, you know, we have the we had those same dates, the stay at home orders, and many of our restaurants are you know just scrambling for how are we going to adjust to this. And some great innovators stepped up and have had some really great success with their ideas. Um, one of them is uh, the uh, Steady Eddies, along with Turkovich, mm-hmm. paired up and made AM, PM isolation kits. <laughs> you can order them online, and they deliver them to your house, and it's a coffee and wine. Um, they also, at the Turkovich, uh, they uh, converted their tasting room staff to delivery staff. And if you order a case of wine, they'll deliver it to Davis or Woodland for free, along with winners. They also have um, pickup hours at their um, at their winery, not the downtown tasting room, but the actual winery on Buckeye, and they time it so if you want to get out and have a walk in the vineyard with your kids, you can, and then they uh, space it out 15 or 20 minutes to the next grouping comes so that um, everybody's safe and nobody's you know all there at once. So they're doing that. Um, Steady Eddie is. Um, you know, doing great service, and most of our um, wineries are just, you know, really doing great. Barry at the brewery has um, their their usual hours Thursday through Sunday, three to five. But they and you can pick up out there. But they're also in Nugget, the Co-op, the Safeway on Cavell and Lorenzo's, so you could pick their stuff up there. We're we're just we're just adjusting and adapting like everyone else, and looking forward to. Um, the days when our friends from, you know, Yolo County and Sol- and Solano and surrounding counties can come out and have a, a, a drink with us and a meal. Right. I'm, I'm really missing those those uh, lazy afternoons out at Berryessa Brewing because, as I think you know, for KDRT, this radio station, we pair up with a lot of bands and, and do a lot of things out there. And, and the owners, have uh, Chris and Lori, have been so great to all the musicians, to the radio station, so... Definitely missing that. I do think this situation, um, I'm seeing a lot of creativity come forth. I'm seeing a lot of good. I'm talking locally. I'm not talking from the national level. I'm seeing a lot of goodwill right. and, and people really, uh, you know, reaching out a hand. And I know one thing I saw you post on Facebook was that you've been uh, somewhat involved with the, the food bank deliveries in, in winters. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I- I actually have a couple things I'd really like to get out to people. One is that Yolo Food Bank is doing a phenomenal effort getting food to people in need, and um, they're delivering over 63,000 uh, pounds of food a week, uh, and 1,500 extra people have signed up. So they're coming out to winners, and they're getting food to, um, to, to everyone all over town. But um, they're doing this special thing where Yolo count, the Yolo bus, um, you know, they were on the 17th of last month saying, how are we going to, how are we going to employ our drivers and how are we going to figure this out so that we don't lose drivers? And Yellow Food Bank had a need for uh, transportation and drivers and they teamed up, they paired up. So some of the drivers from Yellow Bus are driving food bank trucks. And then also Yellow Bus is using their buses and their drivers to get food out to the far reaches of Yellow County. So I think it's really amazing. And I, I am so proud of, uh, the, of, of Carrie, who's the executive director for Yellow Bus, and of Michael Bish, executive director of Yellow Food Bank, for just, you know, getting the creative juices flowing and um, solving problems. Right. And um, we're being really careful about deliveries in town. We have healthy people doing the deliveries we're having people stay inside we put the boxes on the porch knock and go so that there's no interaction um and and um we're just trying to make sure that everybody does things in a safe way um we're really proud that people are staying home that um that that people are using uh their sewing machines and making masks and making non-sew masks and supporting businesses so um we're pretty enthusiastic that, that people are working together and respecting each other's space in winter. Yeah, thanks for bringing forth that that shout out to the food bank. Uh, I'm going to have Michael Bish on the show in, in a couple of weeks here too, so we'll we'll hear from him how that's going. So how is your city council, uh, first of all, how are you meeting? And then secondly, every local government is, is going to be dealing with um, – 
structural deficits and and just kind of uh, uh, you know tax revenues will be down and and all of that so how are you beginning to wrap your collective minds around that oh it's a big question well uh, and i'm really glad you asked it first i the way that i kind of envision like from 3000 feet or 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 30000 feet is that the trajectory for cities is kind of like a, a predator a prey predator map where you know how the like rabbit births go up and then coyote births go up and then rabbit births go down and then coyote coyote births go down that kind of yeah. mapping um, the finances for cities will follow the finances that uh, uh, financial disasters if you will of um, what happens to businesses so um, getting that cares money out to small businesses propping up businesses as much as we can, mm-hmm. um, finding solutions so that they're um, that they could get back in the game as, as safely uh, and quickly as possible will all help cities. But for, for us, um, we have two urgency measures tonight or uh, uh, urgency notices that we're going to consider. One is um, delaying uh, uh, te- transit occupancy tax from um, the Abbey House in our new hotel until September, mm-hmm. and what that will do is allow them to report the amount but not collect it or not turn it in. They can collect it, and they can keep it, and they can use it well um, in this situation. And um, we also have another urgency notice, which is the temporary sus- suspension of um, water, water and sewer um, late fees and shutoffs for our residents. That way, you know, if people... People can pay their um, property taxes and whatever else they have, but we're not going to shut their water off. Um, and, and what we're doing as far as, like, the city, in order to keep people um, doing things for the benefit of the city, um, we're making sure our employees are safe, but we're also on the agenda for tonight is beefing up our sidewalk repair mm-hmm. so that when people do come out, they'll have a more walkable, um, bikeable, safe community. So we're um, we're trying to use the funds that we have in in, in creative ways and also give relief uh, to our businesses. Great. Well, thank you so much for calling in today. We're we're just about out of time here, but it's great to get your update. And um, I'll check back in in with you in a couple of weeks, or or feel free to send me updates. Thanks. Do, can I have a second for a shout out? My um, my baby girl turns twenty five. Uh, Caitlin Flaws. She's a student at UC Davis. She's in grad school now, but uh, on uh, Easter, and I just want to say happy birthday, Caitlin. Happy birthday, Caitlin. All right, Jesse, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank so Take much. care. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to my guest today. I'll be back on Friday with Yolo County Supervisor Jim Provenza.